to another Wildwoods Beekeeping Podcast, and I appreciate you joining in. And tonight, we have David Burns on our chat. We had David on probably about a year ago, so it's already been a year ago, David, since he wow. was with you. So, you know, Tom flies, and I decided to be good to get you back on here and talk a little bit about bees. So I appreciate you joining us tonight. And Absolutely. first, before we get into some things, I think most people probably know who you are, but if you could, for people who are just getting to beekeeping and don't really aren't into the beekeeping community, they just stumble upon this chat if you could can you just um tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into bees yeah well grayson good to be with you tonight i do remember being with you about a year ago that was a fun time so thanks for having me back um never know what to say about myself i'm just uh i'm just a beekeeper and i've uh, been doing it a long time and trying to take what i've learned and share with other people on my youtube channel try to get other people to not have to go through the same mistakes I went through. So, um, yeah, I'm just uh, enjoying making videos like you do. And by the way, uh, I'm really impressed with your channel. Um, that that introduction, that intro you had was beautiful. I loved it. Oh, Thank gosh. You. And uh, what I admire most about you is you keep at it. I mean, you are making videos after videos. Yeah. No matter what, you are just going to keep doing it. That's pretty impressive. I really, I Thank really you. admire you for that. Wow. Definitely. Thank you. It, sometimes it can be hard doing that and, you know, uploading videos, you know, I have two videos already, you know, trying to be in the process, but right now, you know, they're still downloading because they're like 38 minute videos and stuff. You have just, um, me and the B yard and stuff. I try to do some teaching videos too, you know, once in a while I'll get out there and get it. Sometimes it's sometimes I struggle getting myself to do it, but once I do it, you know, it turns out pretty decent, you know, oh, yeah. To, keep yeah, uploading no. and you know as much as i can and that's really it really takes time you know to keep growing and stuff and you know i just trying to keep doing it and keep going at it it's not uh, easy yeah. you know um i've been doing it since 2008 that sounds like forever <clears throat> but what i've uh i'll tell you what it, it i thought it would get easier i got a few you know processes where i can make videos a little quicker i i kind of made enough mistakes like here's an example grayson um, last week I was filming and, you know, the cameras that I use have a battery pack that you punch in them. And, um, I was recording in 4k, so it burns the battery up pretty quick. And I usually know like, uh Oh, you know, I better change the battery now, but, Oh man, I had all, I had all the scenes. Perfect. I mean, I was, I had a, I knew what I was going to look for when I got in that hive. I had the camera set up perfectly microphones going, recorded it. I was feeling like, oh, this is going to be the best video ever. And when I swung around to the back of the camera to turn it off, it said, uh, out of ba out of batteries, camera shut off or something like that. And I was like, no, no, that's horrible. Oh my gosh. I lost. And then I tried to refilm it. I got a new battery in there and I tried to do it again, but now all the bees were not where I needed them to be. And it was like, oh, I lost that. It was so frustrating. And that's that yeah. same day, it was sunny, and my camera overheats if the sun hits it. If I'm in 4K, mm -hmm. and uh, so I made a I made a little umbrella to go above my camera, like on a pole. And uh, I had it set up, and it was real windy that day. Grayson, the wind blew my umbrella over, smacked my camera. My camera went falling on the gravel. Oh, it was just knocked my lens cover off and. Oh, is so you know you have those moments where it's like it's almost like police work. You know, police work is is sheer boredom followed by like two minutes of sheer horror. You know, but this is like I've been filming videos and and haven't had those struggles. So what I did was I just wired at, at the battery 
uh, to AC current. I put a little uh, adapter battery in there. Just going to plug it in on a, on like a, I've got a little, got a huge battery pack that I'm going to plug that camera in because I just can't afford to have great shots like that. So I don't think people realize sometimes what you and I go through just to make a video. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely takes a lot to go through a video. And I've been in that same moment, but too, sometimes, you know, I, the camera I'm using right now, I'm using a Canon Rebel T7. That's what it's called. So it's just a little bit cheaper type camera, and it works good. I've used it out in the B yard, but the problem with this camera is it only records for about maybe 10 minutes, and then it goes off. So here I am out in B yard. I'm doing a good inspection. I'm inspecting, and I'm going pretty long. You know, the video was going to be probably about 20 minutes long, so then 10 minutes half through it shuts off and then when I'm done with the inspection I go on the back uh your your camera stop because you can't record anymore. Oh yeah. Could have had that but sometimes it happens so what I've just been doing I've just been recording with my phone lately and it works fine. You know I'm yeah. always thinking the only sometimes a problem also with this camera here, you know, it's I love it, you know, you know, live streaming here. It looks great. You know, I love the footage. It shows really real life um colors and stuff it really is good yeah the only problem with it is you know out of the b yard you know you have to have a good autofocus camera this camera doesn't do any automatic autofocus you have to oh here and it focuses like that oh see? yeah yeah and it, it just i can't do that especially out of the b yard and if i'm getting up close here's a frame blurs out so i've had a problem with those i'll just try to figure it out and yeah keep going um i do have one question here and it's kind of a past question too. So to, since today was the eclipse, I was wondering if you, you know, spend time any, you know, observing the bees. Did you see anything, you know, different with the bees? You know, did, did the uh, solar eclipse affect, you know, the bees in your area? Well, uh, we're kind of right on the edge. It did get uh, pretty dark here, actually. Um, I don't know how far we are from total um, darkness, but I think it was, we we're probably about 40 or 50 miles north of where it's, you know, it was total, total, whatever. But um, I did monitor my bees and I uh, kept watching. And so what I noticed, Grayson, was before the eclipse, they were walking up the front of the box before they lifted off to, to go forage. And that's pretty common when there's a pretty strong nectar flow. My bees will do that. Most bees do that because they're getting, you know, like there's two runways on a hive. There's the direct runway into the bottom board, <laughs> And then there's a runway where you crawl up the front about an inch or two or three and you lift off from there, stay out of traffic. Yeah. But, you know, not all bees do that. But even when it was really, really the darkest, then it was pretty doggone dark. Um, my bees didn't miss a beat. They were just yeah. in and out like nothing was happening. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I didn't notice any difference with my bees at all. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, I was busy at, during the eclipse. I was, you know, just doing other stuff. And, I, you know, I was thinking about going out to the yard and um, seeing what, you know, if there was any effect. But here, you know, in Alabama, we had, I think it was like an 80% somewhere around there. You could see, you know, I'm, I don't really get into that stuff. So, yeah, you know, I, think, I know in Mobile, it was like 79 points something. Oh, like, okay. So, you know, here's probably around 80, maybe 81%. So, we I did see some notices outside. It was seemed a little bit you know, weird, I guess, for a little bit, but then it just yeah, yeah. on and, yeah. and we carried on for a day. So it's always um, interesting to see how the beach react. You know, that's been a main subject for the past week and um, yeah, now we get there. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, I always find interest in, you know, observing the bees, see, you know, what they're doing. Right. Have a good time doing it. Well, here's the thing with me. I'm, I'm kind of a, maybe I'm a little bit, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I really love astronomy. I, I really do. I have two uh, nice telescopes that, are, that I use a lot and I study astronomy. Been a part of a, I'm a part of an astronomy club and everything. But oddly enough, it doesn't really turn my crank to, to get interested in what bees do during an eclipse, mainly because we don't have an eclipse that often. Yeah. You know, it's nothing, there's no data that I can gather and apply tomorrow. <laughs> so it's yeah. only just sheer entertainment uh, from my point of view that, that I can derive anything from it. So um, it happened a few years back. I set up cameras. I watched everything. I collected data and everything back then. Yeah. 
you know, I, I don't know, call me boring or something, but when it gets dark, bees go back home. When the sun comes up, bees go flying. I mean, yeah. but I know it's like, I know everybody, you know, the traffic and everybody is like, but this only happens so often. It's just fun to, it's just kind of fun to see what bees do. And I get that, but you know, I was out there watching, but at the same time, it it's not something that I was, you know, I could have driven, um, uh, taken some bees a little further South and sure. got in the total darkness, but yeah, it just wasn't enough future data that would really impact beekeeping. So I couldn't get excited about it, I guess. Yeah, I get you. You know, during the whole eclipse, you know, I was thinking maybe you go there, but then at the same time, you know, I was just like, well, I'm going to carry on with something else. You know, just, you know, some things, you know, I can get interested in, you know, like that, you know, it's just, it happens once in a while, of course. Um, yeah. I just got back. I just, you know, I was out biking. I'm a cyclist. My face is red. I was really pushing it hard. It was a hot day. I was like, yeah. ah, I just, and I was watching my clock. I knew I could get back and get on this live stream. And <laughs> I think I broke my all time record biking 20 miles a day so I could get back and be on the air. Then I couldn't get my camera running. It was counting down. I was like, come on. So, uh, yeah, I I, it's, we had a warm day today. It's hot outside. The bees really are tearing it up i mean they're just going to every single tree is flowering the dandelions are almost in full bloom i'd say they're about probably 60 percent in being full bloom but we have a lot of crab apple trees apple trees in our in our uh, property and boy the bees are all over that a little bit windy today but they were still working hard so it's it's pretty impressive yeah definitely well i do have one topic here i think this is a very important topic since you know we are in spring as well if you could just share some basic for you know beginners even for some you know um, beekeepers who you know any beekeeper you know really doesn't matter you know how long we've been keeping bees you could just share a couple good spring uh, management tips some things that you know beekeepers need to be doing in spring you know early spring some basic practices and techniques and some tips that would maybe help them out a little bit yeah yeah thank you grace and i uh i've been looking at um what beekeepers you know kind of go through i i watch what people say on my comment section of my you know youtube channel my live streams and all and that gives me a lot of uh, data about especially what new people are concerned about or maybe don't have their mind wrapped around beekeeping just yet but whether people have been keeping bees a long time or just starting it is really challenging in the spring. You know, we all get excited and think, oh gosh, you know, winter and it's just like scary or my bees going to live. I'm worried. And then we hit springtime and we think, okay, it's spring. But to me, spring is just crazy. It's just, right. you know, I'm, I'm in every hive all the time trying to lo look for swarm cells. I'm trying to split, you know, like this week I'm going to have to start splitting, raising Queens. And so, there's never a dull moment, but I, I guess if people are, let's, let's take the two categories. If someone is brand new to beekeeping, installing a, a package or, or a nuke or something like that, uh, the, the main thing they need to do is just give the hive room to grow. You know, when, when they have about five, six or seven frames drawn out in one brood box um, and they want to go to two brood boxes, they need to add another brood box. When that brood box has five to seven frames, you know, drawn out with bees on it, then they need to add a honey super, sometimes under a queen excluder, or over a queen excluder. So giving bees room to grow. And of course, we all have to deal with um, monitoring our mite loads. That's kind of like really, I think that's one of the more challenging things for a new beginner, because if you use an alcohol wash that, you know, that doesn't that just doesn't sound good to a new beginner to kill 300 bees in order to do a mite test. So um, I, I think the the basic um, concept of starting in the spring as a new beginner is just giving them room to grow, um, making sure, you know, do an inspection at least um, probably every two weeks on a, on a brand new package or a nuke or something, just to make sure the queen's laying good eggs, see eggs and brood, you know, monitor your queen, give room to grow. On a nucleus, you have to work a little faster uh, because they will expand faster. So, um, and an over now an over and winter colony, people that are keeping bees now in their second or multiple years, they're like me and you. We have to go out there and monitor our swarms, swarm cells. We have to make sure the bees aren't going to swarm and make splits. 
stay ahead of the game. And that's, that's kind of hard um, yeah. because the perfect time to, to, to actually make splits or swarm prevention is about one hour before they do it. <laughs> and, and none of us know what that hour is, right? So we try to get further out ahead of it. And uh, yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a, a run for your money to, it's a good problem to have when bees grow and they, they want to multiply and swarm, but then it keeps us hustling. And even I can't, I, even I don't um, always succeed in preventing swarms. There'll, there'll be a swarm cell that I didn't see and off they go to the trees. So yeah. it's a nail biter if you're trying to prevent swarms for sure. Well, definitely. You know, I'm always out there, you know, being intentional and you're trying to make preventing, you know, um, swarms and, Checking queens, you know, evaluating queens, trying to make sure queens, you know, are still good and stuff, you know. And the nukes I got, you know, and the video come out soon, so I can try to, you know, um, spoil it. But all those friends of breed were just pretty, you know, good breed. You know, I looked at all the queens, you know, I look, you know, always whenever you get a nuke, and I'm sure you've probably said this a lot of times, David, you know, it's like, make sure, you know, your queens are good, you know, make sure all that stuff is good. And, you know, I plan on here soon, you know, once they start getting established to start, you know, um, even, you know, start checking for mites, you know. Yeah. It's always important too, even though, you know, you know, you, even though, you know, they're a new nuke, I always want to keep um, checking on them and um, yeah. checking for mites and, you know, some of the basic things and some oh, yeah. thing that kind of goes along with it. I think a lot of beekeepers underplay and is right now, um, since we are in spring, you know, there is a big importance in being able to, you know, feed bees. I was wondering if you could, this kind of goes along with spring techniques too. What are some good ways to feed bees in spring? Why is it in, you know, important to feed bees in spring? Yeah. Um, I, I saw a comment on here that said, what's, what's most overlooked in spring management. And I really think probably feeding is probably what's most overlooked. And, you know, that all depends on where you live too. Now, you know, I've, I've gone through a process where I've, I've kind of, kept bees in the beginning when I started out in, in the early nineties, I think almost 30 years ago, there just wasn't a lot of material. There was no internet. And I didn't have any contacts that I could really learn from it, but like it is now. And so I had to kind of just struggle through some of the feeding techniques. And that's why, um, by trial and error in my own bee yards, um, I just had to figure out a way to, get my bees stronger in the spring and stronger going into winter. So uh, it's different for everybody. And a lot of people tell me that they do it a different way than I do it. And I respect that. I'm never one to say that my way is the only way. My way is the best way. I don't believe that to be true at all. I think there's a lot of paths that you can take to get from Chicago to California. <laughs> and I like the path that I'm on. And I don't know why I just like my road, you know, so same with feeding bees. Um, my way of feeding bees is just, I don't know, it's my little niche that I like doing it. So in the, in the spring, I'll start feeding my bees liquid when I'm maybe um, about three weeks away from a strong honey flow, three or four weeks out. And um, sometimes that's really cold still, and they don't always feed good. So I have to bounce back and forth from hard candy or what some people might also use fondant. And then I'm back to liquid candy. I mean, uh, yeah, liquid sugar water again. So I bounce back and forth, and it's pretty labor intense, but it works for me. And it builds up a lot of bees for me. It really does. So the way I look at it, Grayson, is anytime my bees aren't, producing nectar aren't bringing nectar in and making honey in the in their boxes i like to feed them if they don't have food and they don't have a way to get food i feed them so right. as of now i'm stopping all feeding because the dandelions are about 50 percent in full blossom good enough for me i'm not going to give my bees i'm just going to let them drain out the liquid feed that they have now and once that's over i'm going to just go out there and start putting supers on because, you know, I want to cash in on this uh, nectar honey crop that looks pretty promising this year by the forecast. So, yeah, that's probably something. Uh, we got some storms coming in and out, but that's what I'll be doing. But I, I think probably feeding um, is just one of those things where, for me, I like to feed liquid. And I add, I add pollen powder or yeah, pollen substitute powder and 
I mean, oh, bee booster, honey, be healthy, just a little bit, just enough. I mean, it boy, doesn't take much at all. I, I go way below label usually. Uh, the label recommends, well, I use about anywhere from a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon per quart of one-to-one -one sugar water. So I don't, it doesn't take much at all, just a little bit. And then I put about a teaspoon of protein powder or pollen substitute, Ultra B, it's what I'm using now. And uh, boy, that really helps my bees uh, get really built up good for spring. But yeah, once dandelions up, all feeding is over. Definitely. You know, we have some, you know, dandelions and clover here blooming. We have a lot of other things, you know, privet starting to come up here. Of course, you know, pollen and nectar is different in certain locations. So I'm sure, I'm sure you have a good bit of stuff blooming in your area. I have a good bit of stuff, you know, blooming here. And I definitely agree with you there. You know, I've always, you know, built in, you know, the same thought, you know, I'll feed the bees, you know, early, you know, going into spring, build them up. And then right there, you know, when we hit that big flow, you know, let them slowly take out all the ever syrup and then start giving yeah. them supers, let them take off what, you know, the nectar flow is providing once it gets really nice and firm and strong. You know, that's what I've always seen and always like to do. And, you know, I've been, I'm going to be feeding my nukes, you know, that I got for maybe a week, you know, probably maybe at the most, you know, two weeks. And after that, I'm going to, you know, let them go off a little bit. You know, of course, it's going to be I day to the day, you know, you know, every two weeks, you know, to be able to look and tell if they you know, need to keep feed on or if they don't. Yeah. You know, I don't really plan on trying to do any honey this year, but, you know, <laughs> if they start to boom off and there's still good nectar flow, you know, it just really depends. But I've not, I'm not really going to do anything big with them this year. I'm just going to let them kind of start growing up. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Next year, you know, we'll have a good, you know, crop. Yeah. And, you know, and be able, you know, once they're strong next year, you know, then we'll yeah. be able to get some good honey. Well, that's that's something that we always uh, manage a lot in the spring, too. And I never talk about it much because it's just something that yeah. I don't know why I don't talk about it. But we we make we've always made a lot of nukes, you know, um, boy, I don't know when I started making nukes out of the bee yard uh, here, but um, I've, I've made a lot of nukes every year and um, I have a partner now that uh helps me with the nuke yard and he manages all the bees and produces all the nukes and everything and uh, so that's one of the things that that we also do is producing our nukes every year so that goes crazy as well you know how do you uh you know in the, all those hives that aren't here on on my property all those hives have to be managed and split and treated for mites and inspected by the bee inspector and you know, all those things have to be, um, all those nukes have to be prioritized in our work too. Plus, you know, we, we do packages as well. So that's coming up in a few weeks. So, oh my gosh, there's so much to do, but I did have a question for you, Grayson. Um, yes, I want to know about, uh, I want to know about your, um, your small high beetle uh, oh. infestation where you live. I, I think I've always thought where you live in the South like that, that it's got to be worse there is that true do you battle small hay beetle oh i have a lot you know last year was really really bad for them and i have a, i had a lot of hives last year up scone and you know your house up there up north you know you don't have as many you know beetles and of course up north you know how many beetles you you know y'all you know y'all have a lot of people up north you know if they you know you know say oh wow those are a lot of beetles and that's down here like well that's not many compared to what we have so you know down here we have a good bit of beetles i haven't seen them as much right right now but uh they are you know there last year was worse i think because you know our flow is bad and, and they just love to get in, into those hives and a lot of my hives were down lower and this year we're gonna try to do some different stuff to try to you know combat against them you know i've used um beetle blasters beetle barns and all that other stuff and it helps out a lot a little bit but it just with how many beetles we had last year, it just didn't do the trick that I needed. So what we plan on doing down here is, you know, you may have heard of it. I can't say, I think it was Dixie Towels or something. And I yeah. saw, a good, you know, a good buddy of mine, you know, down here in Alabama, Bruce from the stream team. I think, I think you were on. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know Bruce. Yeah. And, you know, that's really the main reason why I, you know, went into this whole community thing. And I remember, Back then, you know, you're one of the YouTubers, you know, I watch and stuff, you know, bees. So, you know, you're the one of the reasons why, you know, I'm kind of here and, you know, I appreciate well, you, you that too. 
And, yeah. you know, I saw, hey, you know, somebody was having you on. I was like, all right, I should probably watch it. And then, you know, I, you know, um, when that, and I commented some and watched it, it was a good chat. And that's the main reason why I'm in this little community. But, you know, he, you know, I saw a video of his about these, you know, Dixie Towels because, you know, he's in a similar place as me. Right. So I said, hey, well, I'll try it. You know, I haven't got the time to get it yet, um, but I'm going to try them out and see how it works for me. I haven't tried it out yet. And some other different things too. So, we'll so I, one of the things I have you seen the, you seen the, there's a guy on YouTube. I think he's called Bug Farmer. Maybe I That's don't know. Right. I, is that uh, right? I and see. he he kind of took a a vac that you use in a car to kind of clean your car up. That's right. And he actually had a video where he showed how you can modify it That's and right. make a. I think, I don't know what he calls it, a Beetle Blaster 500 or 5,000. You know, he, he didn't really patent it or it's just like concept, but you know, anybody can do it. He just shows you how to do it. But, and I think Bruce actually started That's using right. it. Yeah. So I, I got one and I've been playing with it. That thing, that thing is doggone good. It really is impressive. I mean, I've always been trying to smash these beetles. They jump down into a cell, you know, and I'm like, oh, I can't get it. My, you know, I hate to tear the comb up to smash a beetle, but boy, this little, this little vacuum, you know, it's battery powered, fits in your hand like a nice little gun. I mean, it's just like easy to use. And I'm going to really capitalize on using that this year because I've always felt like the more beetles that you can kill, then the less you're going to have, because, you know, I, I know the biology of the small hive beetle really well, and they, they can multiply to the thousands so quickly in one hive. And it's just, they can get away from you so quick. So uh, this year, I'm going to do a little better. I'm going to use some grub eggs. Have you heard of that? It's like I've heard of that. No. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to use some grub eggs down on in the bee yard that's in the shade. I made a mistake. I, I really thought it was going to be pretty down there and be better footage and easier on me than in the hot sun. But boy, the beetles took advantage of that. <laughs> it was like wow. <laughs> I almost moved them out of there, but it's so much work to move them because they're all big colonies. It's not a lot. I, I think on, I call it my YouTube studio yard and yeah. I've got about 20 hives that I film out of. And I wind up filming the ones I still have several of their closer to my property or where I live. And I wind up, I wind up usually just filming out of those because it's easier to take all my equipment, you know, sure. five feet rather than 20 feet. Uh, a quarter mile away. So anyway, yeah, I'm going to have to really stay on top of beetles better this year. I got a little lazy last year, I'm afraid, but it didn't hurt my bees any. I mean, they didn't abscond. It it, sure. it looked pitiful, but the bees just <laughs> kind of put up with it, I guess. That's right. I get you. And I have heard of, you know, grub X and, you know, I want to get that too. I want to try it out. I want to try a lot of these different things out and these, you know, um, beetle sucker 5,000 or something like that. I can't remember. Right? Yeah. I think but, something like that. Yeah. And I saw that, and I, I thought it was pretty cool. And you know, it's you know, really interesting design. And I know Bruce got one, and he tried it out, and he said uh, it worked good. Um, and I yeah, got a few it. little problems with it. The little flapper, little flapper on the inside that kind of opens up, it doesn't seem to close as good as it should. And I, oh, <laughs> I, I held my finger up. So I got a thumbs up now. But I, oh. it seems like I need to modify that on the inside that flapper can close better. And the other thing is if you're not careful, you can suck, you can destroy bees. <laughs> uh -huh. You can ruin your bees too, by you've got to got to find some beetles that don't have a lot of bees around them in order to get them sucked up. But yeah, it's kind of challenging, but back to the grub X, you know, there was a, a entomologist that has been worked a couple of entomologists that have been working on grub X and they show that it's pretty, pretty promising results on, on that. So yeah, well, and we have a lot of other grub problems in, in our, we live on about four or five acres here and we have those moles or whatever those ground things are that just tear your yard up. And I, somebody said, oh, they're eating all your grubs under there, you know, whatever's under there, they're just rooting through there. So we think if we can get that under control, they'll keep, keep they'll stop tearing up our yard too. Hopefully. I get you. We do have a couple questions here. So I guess we'll go on and answer yeah. a couple of them. See, um, the Morris Homesteads and said, and here she says, should I be doing an alcohol wash this time of year? Well, that's a matter of <laughs> philosophy. In fact, uh, when I was uh, speaking with some other uh, speakers 
uh, about a month ago at a conference, we all decided that one of the things we always need to precede our answers with is this. It, we need to say, it depends. <laughs> so it always depends on something, right? It depends right. on the weather. It depends on how many bees you have. Is that a new package you're talking about? Is that a nucleus? And I don't like to really, personally, I don't like to, I, I wouldn't want to do a real quick alcohol wash on a 10,000 bees because a package. Yeah, it's not that many bees yet. They're not real established. You know, you could do it. It's fine. It would work. But you're going to have to wait for a generation of bees to actually where the mites could go ahead and start uh, reproducing in the closed cells. So I like to give them a couple of weeks to grow a little bit. But um, if the weather's good and you got a lot of bees, you've overwintered some colonies, uh, you know, and it's above 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, now's a good time to to do a mite test. Oh, yeah. um, just just check it out and make sure uh, some people like to use, you know, a salic acid when you have less brood. So maybe maybe your bees don't have a ton of brood yet. So that would be more effective too. all those little things come into play. Um, temperature, weather, you know, because if you do a mite test, you're going to have to respond to it. So if it's still right. cold, if you're way up north and you do a mite test on a nice warm day, but then maybe your treatment won't work because you're going to have a week of you know, 40 degree weather. So a lot of things depend on that. Definitely. And since, you know, we're kind of on the mite topic, I was going to ask you is, you know, what are some, you know, um, your um, top um, treatments, you know, to treat for mites? Do you have a specific way of doing it? Do you like to, you know, use different ones to try to prevent, you know, um, beetles, you know, I mean, not beetles, I mean mites to um, um, get a resistance against it or, you know, is there any hmm. type of, you know, good way and treatments and some techniques that you like to use. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, that's, that's good. I mean, I, I'm not crazy, um, about using a lot of treatments. Um, I've tried really hard to raise bees that seem to do pretty well without having to have treatments. Um, I don't think last year, I don't think I had any colonies last year that, um, scared me with their mite count. I don't think there was any that really warranted me having to pull out the big guns. I have, don't get me wrong. I mean, if my, if I do an inspection and, and I see that I've got, you know, 15, 30 mites <laughs> on a hundred beads, I'm, I've got to do something for sure. But yeah, I'm not seeing that, but usually, you know, my, my approach from the beginning has always been, I like to use all the very, you know, like IPM integrated pest management. I like to do things that, I can have better control of like a green drone comb to trap mites in that. That works really good for me. I cycle those out. Um, I, I don't do powdered sugar dusting. I have done it a lot. Used to do it all the time, but I've kind of changed. I kind of swapped that for my push in queen cage. So I can isolate my queen in a push in queen cage during the months of July, August, September when mites really grow and she can't lay uh, but in that little hundred cell square that she's in for a week, I do it for about a week. And so that, that really cuts down on the mites being able to reproduce. I do that. And, um, and then, um, I'll, you know, I, I feel that the screen bottom board helps just a little tiny bit. Uh, mites might fall through it if they get dislodged from the bees. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think just green drone comb, push in queen cage, and uh, just controlling the mites like that, it, it really helps a lot for me. Yeah. Definitely. You know, I, I you know, usually take the same views too, you know, try to do that too. You know, I've treated and tested, you know, before I use um, that, oh, I can't remember the name. It's just, you know, what it shake. You know, there's different ones that you can use. Cell thanks to one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have it on me. Of course, I, you know, I'm always isolated in this little um, setup. But, yeah. you know, um, I like to use um, those type of testers, and you know I've I uh, have some Apigar around here, but I'm you know I've used before, you know, and Apivar. Those are two of them I you know want I'll use, you know if my you know I might start out of hand, but you know if I'm feel comf comfortable, you know with the mite count, you know I'll just you know do some. Also, you know you can also incur incorporate you know some of the, you know different techniques you know you you use. You know I've watched your videos before, and you know I've listen to all those techniques and you know um i don't have a pushing queen cage you know i think that'd be a good idea to get one and try it out you know it'd be a good little thing to 
test out and you know good stuff there and uh, i think we got a couple questions that we can answer real quick some good ones and this kind of goes to um i guess genetics too you, you know mites too do you, do you, did you bring any vsh for your bees david yeah you know uh, years ago gosh and i wish i knew what year it was i i can't remember it was so long ago. <laughs> Everybody thinks, you know, VSH is kind of a new thing recently, but it's been around for a long time. Like me, I've been around for a long time. <laughs> um, and I I was a part of an an Illinois initiative uh, to, to, to actually have VSH queens and all. And, and so back then, I, I mean, it was like, I don't, I'd hate to say how long ago, but to me, it feels like it was 15 years ago, something like that. But um, but we did, uh, we were using liquid nitrogen back then to actually take a, a soup can cut out on both ends. And so we would pour that on the brood and monitor how long it would take for them to, you know, the next day or two, would they clean that out nicely? And then we felt like we had a good, a good queen that was doing that. So, or the bees and all. So, you know, yes, I have played with that and I have back then when I was, I spent some time trying to produce, trying to create a very good line of queens. Um, and so I bought queens from all over the place, from everybody that had, you know, reputation of good queens, even yeah. Buckfast and Carniolans and, you know, VSH and ankle biters. I went over to, to Purdue, got some of their queens, you know, a decade or two decades ago, whenever they were doing that from in the beginning and ran those, tested those. So I, I've done all that. Yeah, I really have. And, oh, wow. I, um, I just figured out that what works better for me is like I'm doing this year is um, you I've spent, I think three or four years now watching man, I wouldn't say three or four, but at least two or three years watching one particular queen perform outstandingly. And of all the hives here, she has done just super. And I've made videos about her. So, oh my gosh, you know, I, those genetics are a winner. They really are. And so I'll be raising Queens from her. So every year I seem to pick the winner who, you know, who's the best overwintered, makes the most honey, doesn't have to be treated for mites, you know, just gentle, gentle to work. That's a big one for me too. I won't raise any Queens out of a hive that just stings me to death. It's like, Nope, you're out. Definitely. Oh yeah. I, I do think VSH has uh, a lot of promises. I don't, I don't think it's really, you know, anything like changing the landscape all that much. Like, I don't think we can just go to one person who has a 100% <laughs> VSH queen. We buy that queen, all your trouble, all your mite troubles are over. I don't yeah. think we're there. I don't think we're going to be there in my lifetime, but it does help a little bit. Yeah. People are, are working hard to make that help. And John Harbo and all those people will, that do a lot of work in that area, they know what they're doing and they're trying to make it happen. So yeah, it, it has a lot of promises for us. Definitely. You know, a lot of people, you know, like you said, you know, um, a lot of times people think, you know, that will help with everything. You know, you don't have to worry about mites again. You know, I always view it as something that will help, you know, with the mites. You know, it, you know, will add something else to, you know, protect yeah. your bees against mite, but it's, mites. But it's not always, you know, a thing that will, you know, your bees will, you know, not die from, you know, for real mites or anything. Or, you know, your bees are um, fully resistant you know, to right. mites. Of course, you know, they are partially, you know, resistance, you know, they can do some good things to incorporate and help, you know, you know, fight off against feral mites, which, you know, I always, you know, view it as. And since, you know, you're kind of starting to, you know, talk about raising queens, I was wondering if, uh, this is just a personal question, I was just going to want to ask is, kind of when do you plan on starting to raise your queens in um, your area? Yeah, like right now, I'm still making up a lot of mating nukes, uh, I, I have a lot of made new boxes, but some of them are old. I don't want to use them anymore. I, I never spend a lot of money when I make my mating nukes up. I usually use, <laughs> I've used cheap plywood and everything like that. And so over the years, they kind of get bad and I have to replace some of them, but doing that now. And I, uh, I'd love to start raising Queens right now. Um, but that means I have to go out there and kind of make, start make, you know, you have to shake nurse bees out. You have to weak, weaken strong colonies to get ever get all their you have to steal a lot of bees from colonies that really you know they're not in that stage yet where they're making splits or they're making swarm cells so to answer your question i really like to do it 
about a week before the bees start doing it naturally. When the bees start raising, you know, swarm cells, I can, that's the time for me to start raising queens because that's when they do it. And so I, it's just a weird game we play in Illinois where is it going to be warm enough to do that now? I'll tell you what, I've, I've been bit by doing it too early and it didn't, it didn't help me at all. It set me back really bad. So I'm kind of biting, you know, my nails and I think, and I've always kind of made a commitment that around May the 1st, I feel like that's going to be okay for me to go ahead and green light of May 1st. Cause even if we get a cold snap, you know, in the month of May, it won't last long, but in April we can still get snow and cold weather. So <laughs> I, I, I want to start raising Queens. I'm ready. I, I want to. And, um, but I'm still fighting this, this weather. Is it, are we going to have a cold snap? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, down here in Alabama, you know, we've been, really warm lately right now it's is raining which i don't think this mic will pick it up it's really really light raining here you know we've been really really warm you know i'm sure down here a lot of people i actually really i think in late february actually i think it was like early march some beekeepers down here already did some splits so you know it's you guys don't have winter come on you don't have winter in alabama (laughs) yeah what do you yeah, have? Like really. a like a you got three days of winter down there. <laughs> oh yeah, my like gosh. maybe like thirty days where we'd get down, you know, to freezing. You know, our you know water water would freeze, and after that, you know, we just kept going up and down. You know, we'd have lows of 35, 32, 34, oh 33. Sometimes we'd have those warm days, forty lows, and then highs would have. 55 60 sometimes even you know some you know there's a day where you know we're in, during winter like multiple days and i was able to get out there 70 degrees and go out there go on and inspect the hive and i kept wow. people entertained throughout whole winter you know people up north weren't, weren't able to inspect their bees i was down here just hey guys look here i'm just inspecting my bees here <laughs> I know. Just, like, December. It, now, I, I actually go ahead i so i i'm always you know, like i i you know, I don't really watch a lot of view, YouTube videos, believe it or not, because, you know, I'm busy making my own. But, you know, when I'm posting mine or, or doing something like that, I'll notice other beekeepers thumbnails. And I know this winter I'm looking at thumbnails and it's beekeepers way in the south. And I'm they're talking about, you know, hey, my bees made it through winter. Look, look what's happening in the winter. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, really? It's like, Wow. I guess, and I would probably, I'm th- people farther north than me probably view me that way. I'm sure people in Canada or northern Michigan, they probably think, David, you don't have a winter. But I remember this, Grayson, one year, uh, gosh, I don't remember what year it was when I was early on in keeping bees. We had 32 days, I think it was 32 days where the temperature never got above freezing. I hate you that's how cold it is. I mean, the bees are just clustered for so long and, you know, people way up North put them in sheds or buildings, you know, to protect them. But, Oh, wow. We have some bad winters, but that's why I went to work and figured out a way that I can really help my bees not, you know, freeze to death in the winter. That's right. Yeah. We're on the prairie. It's so windy and cold. Yeah. During Hmm. winter, you know, we'll have some wind too. So, you know, I still, even though really, you know, we don't, we don't get cold. I still, you know, do some basic preparations, yeah. of course. And you know, everybody, no matter where you're at, it's always good to do some preparations. But I did inspect some hives on Christmas Eve. I made a good video wow. about that. And, you know, wow. on Christmas Eve, and I was just in yeah. there. It was nice. And Christmas Day, you know. Well, that's I, impressive, yeah. It was 70 degrees on Christmas. But the bad thing about that, people are like, oh, wow, it must be nice. Go outside and have shorts on. Go outside have a good time. Well, you know, we, it was warm, of course, but it was raining. So, of course, yeah, yeah. So. that's true. It decided it wanted to rain on Christmas, on Christmas. So, but yeah, uh, we do have a question here and a couple more questions we'll answer. It says Canera J65, or I don't know exactly how you say Canera, but thoughts on Wari house with Langstroth frames. Oh, um, okay. Um, you know what? Wari hives, um, were created in the 50s by Mr. Warre. And as far as I know, their measurements are nowhere close to the same measurements as a Langstroth frame. And the idea of a true Warre hive 
is they they do have like a Langstroth um, sides and bottoms to their frames usually. Um, not always. Sometimes they use just the top bar on a worry hive. But um, the idea is to is to not disturb your bees on a worry hive. You don't want to really open them up. You want to you want to bottom super or bottom put boxes on the bottom. And um, yeah, I don't I don't think I would ever try to make Langstroth hives fit a worry hive. I mean, you'd have to change the dimensions, the size of a true worry hive. I mean, you could, but then you're kind of just using a a Langstroth hive because <laughs> you know they are both vertical hives. They're not horizontal hives. They're vertical hives. So, um, yeah, there's the the concept. You to really get into a worry hive. I'm sure the worry community would appreciate if worry beekeepers followed their exact protocols. And they're pretty passionate about that. The quilt box, you know, the the, the worry concept is just hold all the pheromones the same. Don't disrupt them a lot. Bottom, bottom box, bottom super. So be a little tricky doing the length straw frame. Yeah. I get you. Um, do you got to real quick say um, thanks to Tom there for the donation. I really appreciate it. And hey, guys, I just tuned in. Tech season has kept me away. Keep up the good work, Grayson. You guys ought to try winning on the Canadian border. We do get abused. <laughs> yeah, I know Tom. Tom's a great one. Yeah, he's uh he's way up there where it's cold. I think he can throw a rock into Canada. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely. You know, we had him on the live stream too. We talked a little bit about you know B taxes. You know. Oh yeah. That's so, say you know. Yeah. I saw your live with him too, so that was a good one too. Yeah. So, Straight Creek um, Apiary Brian G. What are your thoughts on adding the second D box under the established? Will they fill them with wax faster? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I I always feel that bees are going to follow what we've always seen them do, and they seem to always want to go up, or at least we want them to go up. Yeah. <laughs> um, in nature, like if they were in a tree or when I take bees out of houses, walls and houses, they start high up and then they build their comb downward. Would they do it? I think they would. Yeah, I'm sure if that space were there, I think they would do it. Um, but we all follow this protocol that we want our bees to, to build upward. And uh, so I think that's probably going to be the faster way to do it is by putting things above them than below them. And the reason that is because if you stop and think about it, what goes on below, well, what goes on near the entrance is different than what goes on higher up. So near the entrance, we have you know, more things that are like, we know they have the dance floor where all the waggle dancers are coming in. Oftentimes they have more bee bread or things going on there that they don't have higher up. So, you know, they do put brew down there, but I think in the, I've, I've always noticed my bees um, treat the bottom deep a little bit different than they do our top deeps here in Illinois. Yeah. They, they seem to go to town a lot more on that top deep, especially in the fall and spring. Yeah, I, I get you. I've tried it before, you know, a couple times thinking maybe they'd draw it out quicker. Not they, they never really did. So, you know, I yeah. had better success putting it on top rather yeah. than under right. it. Yeah. Uh, see, David, from question from Beekeeper Bro, David, what is your favorite nuke size? Yeah, there I guess there can be a lot of different sizes, but obviously a five frame nucleus is my my winning size. Um some some of my mating boxes are three frame wide just because I'm lazy. I don't need a lot of frames in there, <laughs> but five frame works good. And I use all deep frames. So I try to keep everything pretty consistent. Um, so a five frame nuke box is nine inches wide on the outside and about almost 20 inches long, like a normal hive. And so, you know, then you have your deep frame. That's about what nine and an eighth or something inches in depth. So I like my nuke boxes to stay in that. Yeah. Five frame nuke. Definitely. Question from Brian Bennett it says, How long after you see drones will they start mating with queens? Mm. Well, you know, it's really hard to tell because when you look in a hive and you see drones, you may not know how old they are. Um, so it, it, that would kind of be hard, hard to actually observe what age ages your drones are. But 
for the most part, I've noticed in my hives uh, about a week ago, or maybe a little bit earlier, I saw drones flying. They were taking mating flight or <laughs> they were going out looking, you know, for virgin queens. That's what drones do. Um, I thought they were taking cleansing flights, but they were pretty uh, direct and going far away. So they were already trying to scout the area out. So I, th I think you would just, uh, Brian, I think you would just want to go ahead and watch what your drones are doing. You see drones coming in and out. Um, yeah, that's the best time. But yeah, we can we can watch drone cells in the hive and we can calculate it out um, how old they are when they're they're their best to be mating with virgin queens. But no beekeeper, I don't think, or no backyard beekeeper is really going to calculate that out and know really how old their uh, drones are. But I think I think once they're um, they start flying, um, they're pretty mature. I think they're mature. I could be wrong, but you know, these numbers all run together. It seems like it's about 23 days, um, after about 23 days old, maybe, uh, to, they're pretty mature, but maybe, maybe it's longer than that. But yeah, when they start flying and taking mating flights, it doesn't, they, they just go to work. So my, my drones are out there busy now looking for drone congregation areas. Yeah, definitely. Got to say thank you. Thank you, Brian, um, for $10 donation. We definitely appreciate you. Yeah. Um, good people there, you know, supporting and, you know, just commenting and asking questions. You know, we appreciate it. Um, Mirror Tribe, um, good comment there. I think there's two questions. So let's start with number one. I've got about 300 pounds of medium frames full of capped and uncapped two to one from fall feeding leftovers stored in rubber made bins what should i do with them can i give them for can i give it to them for fee now oh yeah i mean uh that's that's really good i, I made a video last week uh about checkerboarding and of course you could make frames put five frames of that, those full um honey suit uh, frames in there and stagger them with five undrawn you sound like you have some that's not all the way drawn out that might help if you're wanting to do some checkerboarding above your brood box, but I've done that a lot, you know, some, some hives that I want to help them build up, I'll give them a, a super. And uh, sometimes they drain it out because they need it in the spring. Other times they don't need it. So they just keep adding to it and you just keep adding. But if it is sugar water full of sugar water, what really wasn't nectar from nectaries of flowers, what you probably want to do is keep track of that, like mark the frames or the box that it's not really honey that came from flowers. And that way you can keep track of it. And, uh, but you can use it to feed the bees. Another thing you could do, which I don't know if I really like this idea a lot, but you could set it out far away from your hives and let the bees rob it out. But with that comes a lot of, uh Oh, moments <laughs> like, uh Oh, I didn't take it far enough away. Now they're robbing hives in that yard or something, you know? So Letting them rob it out is is one thing to do, but I think I'd rather just keep it intact and put it on top of weaker hives that need nourishment. Yeah, I def I get you. David Pickett says, "What about top hive bar?" Yeah, you know I've ran some top uh, top bar hives and um, never have successfully overwintered one. And I have tried, we actually manufactured and sold them for way back and for, for years. When, there was a time when top bar hives were really kind of like the poster child of natural beekeeping. And you throw some wood together, top bar only, no sides, kind of got a V shape to them and away you go. And then we had some um, studies, not really studies, but people that were saying, you know, you should put regressed bees in your top bar hives and Regress bees mean that the bees are smaller, so they have smaller size cell, and that sometimes has been equated with lower mite loads and all that. But in my experience, I just couldn't, I couldn't really, the top bar highs for me didn't cut the bill because I need to be able to, har I need to be able to harvest my frames, spin it, you know, in my extractors built for Langstroth hives. And you can do all of that if you're a backyard beekeeper and you want to run a top bar hive and you want to do crush and strain method, or if you've got a special wire cage in your extractor that you can put those in there, you can do all that. But um, it's pretty tough. I think I think when I was um, a, few, a month ago when I was out 
West and I was talking with Randy Oliver. I think it was Randy that told me. And of course, I've said this for years too, but it was good to hear another person say it, that bees on a horizontal hive have difficulty moving to where the honey is when it gets extremely cold because they cluster, you know, if they're all vertical, they can move up between the combs up into the honey. But when they're, when they're horizontal, they have to go down out of the frames and go under the frames because the top bar hive is all uh, sealed off at the top by the frame bars. They can't go around the frames above them. Sometimes they can go by the sides, but they have to go around the bottom. So it's hard for bees to break cluster and go. Now, when I say that, I'll get bombarded with top bar people who will tell me that, you know, they have thousands of top bar hives. They overwinter. They've never lost a, a top bar hive in 50 years. <laughs> so people are doing it. You know, I'm exaggerating, but people have figured it out how to do it. But I just had to throw in the white towel. I surrender. I can't, the white flag. I can't do this, you know, can't get them through winter. Although I do have that little round hive that it's kind of like a top bar hive. They're, they're horizontal. And um, they're making it through winter. They're impressive. Yeah. Nice. I've, I've, I've seen that have on you know, your channel. It's pretty cool there. It is. Yeah, it I know. Is. So um, is it doing now, you know, doing well? Oh, yeah. I, 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 when I rode my bike uh, by them today, uh, a little bit ago, they were just out there going in and out, in and out. So, yeah, they're having a good time. Darn. They're, that's pretty impressive. I thought maybe that everyone's going to see that and, and think, man, the guy didn't treat that for three years now. He hasn't done anything about beetle control. He doesn't feed them and they just purr along like crazy, but you know, they're not, they're not that big. They're not making a ton of honey, but you know, Tom, Dr. Tom Seeley spoke, uh, written about that in, in his books and talked about Darwinian beekeeping. And that's kind of his idea that bees can do pretty good if they're kept small and we don't mess with them a lot, you know? Mm. Yeah, maybe there's something to that. Definitely. Tom asked, Grayson, are you going to rear coins this year? Well, I've pondered around that a couple times. You know, I've, I've done it last year. You know, I've had some good success with that. And, you know, sometimes some, some things that didn't go, you know, really well. I think I did okay on the grafting part. I think I had one that was like 50% out of 100% or something. So I guess it's not terrible. But That's more good. I get, you get used to it, you know, I'll get a little bit more better at it and I'm going to try it. Last year, you know, I wasn't able to do it as much. I was able to get some queens, actually, though, some virgin queens. You know, I put them in yeah. the incubator and I tried that out. The problem was whenever I got done raising queens, I didn't think I was going to have any success. I was just trying to see if it did good. But then I ended up with two virgin queens and I didn't know where to put them. Yeah. So then, you know, I put them, I just kind of stuck them in the hive and um, let them maybe stay there for I was planning on letting them stay there for about a day or two just to give me time to make up a nuke or something to use them with. And then when that, unfortunately, they didn't make it. So yeah. this year, if I raise coins, I'm going to make sure I know where I'm, what I'm going to be doing with them. Yeah, know, yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I've i always loved raising queens a lot. Um, the, the, the thing, the winning thing for me, and I've trained a lot of people how to raise queens. But the thing is, um, I've trained people to raise queens for me even. Um, and so the, the magic, the magic and queen rearing all relies in how many nurse bees of the right age you can put in that starter box. I, I, that's how I raise my Queens. And if I can pack it very full of the right age, you know, six to 11 day old nurse bees in that starter hive, when I put my graphs in there and the second winning thing is that you got to get the smallest, smallest larva that you can you don't you just got to drill down and i know you know when i train people to do it they always want to take like a five-day-old larva you know and it's not gonna if it does make a queen to be a pitiful queen you got to do a one-day-old larva and dunk on it that thing is just tiny it's the size of a comma on a page i mean it's a, you know printed page and it's just like people when i show them where it is they're like i don't see anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but so that, that that's the winning ticket if you can have that starter hive packed full of the right age nurse bees and those nurse bees need to be well fed i feed my nurse bees before i put them in there i feed the colonies that i take them out of before i put them in there so they real you know nurse bees have the hypopharyngeal gland the mandibular gland that produces the royal jelly and and so they, the more well-fed they are, the more royal jelly they're going to make. So they, they're the ones that really need to get that started. 
and then move them, moving them over after 24 hours, the graphs into a real strong um, hive uh, above a queen excluder where they can continue to feed them is, is money. That works every time. It just works so good. But that's the key. Small, small graphs and then lots of nurse bees. If you don't do that, you're going to get small queens. And I know some small queens are okay, but in my experience and my opinion only, I feel like larger queens just are much better queens than the smaller queens are. And yeah. I just think there. I, sometimes I worry that small queens are small because of malnutrition. And so they may not have as, as large ovaries, ovaro, uh, may not be able to produce as many queen or eggs. So, yeah. Definitely. Let's see, we've got a question here from Catherine. She asked, um, is it better to start a package in a five frame nuke or a 10 frame? Yeah, you know, I've made videos about that and I've spoken about that, written articles and blogs about it. Um, there is something to be said in my experience that I've actually installed packages to test that theory out. And oh my gosh, they do build up super fast in a five frame nuke. <laughs> it is incredible. And then it's just like you throw them in there and like, Five days later, it seemed like all the frames are drawn out and they're just going like gangbusters. So, yeah, you do have to move them over. Where you put them sometimes in a in a 10 frame box, uh, what happens, they they might, and especially if you're using undrawn comb, they under undrawn foundation, they might not draw the foundation out except on a frame or two. And then they can't really do much ex once the queen fills those egg eggs in those two frames. They don't have any more room to lay eggs. They might replace the queen thinking it's her fault. So I, I really do like the five frame nuke, but boy, you have to stay after it because they will they will fire up in there fast. Definitely. Yeah. Do you prefer 10 frame or eight frame honey production setup? I've done both. And the only reason I prefer... 10 frame is because that's what all my boxes are. <laughs> I think I have like, oh, no more than five eight frame boxes or hive setups for eight frames. But they they do both work just as good. They really do. You know, I, I don't see a difference in them other than it's, it's easier on your back to lift a eight frame uh, super than a 10 frame. I measured one of my supers that I made a video on last week, Grayson. It weighed 51.4 pounds. Uh, with all the frames capped over and the wood and the wax and everything. But, you know, you're picking up a 50 pound box and I think each of those super, let's see, is that right? Yeah. I think each one, well, you know, each frame weighs a lot. So if you take two of them out, it's going to cut down on the weight. Yeah. If we have one more question here, then we'll kind of wrap it up since we're right here at eight o'clock. Richard R. Brian Jr. says, what are some red flags to look for when you catch a swarm? It tells you that you need a queen. Yeah. Uh, well, Richard, most of the time a swarm, it's really good about, um, you know, their queen being there with them. It doesn't always work out that way, but most of the time you've got your, the queen from the parent colony. She's with that big swarm. You go shape it, shake them in a box, a, a hive and away you go. I think your concern is how do I know I got the queen, you know, um, after I shake them in that box. And that, that is a problem. I, you know, I've, I've collected a lot of swarms, and I've collected swarms with other beekeepers and I can tell when they didn't get the queen because it seems like half of the bees will go back on that limb or that tree. You always expect some to go back up there because the pheromone order odor is so strong. But to see half of that swarm go back up there, you know, the queen's up there, you know, because uh, you can even see Nasanoff glands being sprayed sometimes. So I, I think the best telltale sign is to just make sure you can shake or sweep or whatever you're using to get the majority of the bees in that hive. And then you even need to leave the lid open or the bottom board open to let the rest of them get in there. And then what you want to look for is I like to wait until the next day. So after I wait, you know, the next day, like overnight, then all the bees settle down on the frames. Yeah, at first, they're just in there all over the place. But once they spread out, it's much easier to inspect them. So once the bees have spread out the next day in that new box that I shook the swarm into, I just go through and look for the queen. That's a simple thing that I do. But I can tell, too, because I can go back to the tree and, like, nobody's there. So if the queen was there, there'd be a baseball-sized group of bees at least protecting her. But that's, that's kind of what we do is go back. You can wait a few days even, but... Number one, check 
check the old site, make sure there's no bees balled up around a queen. And then secondly, wait a day or two and check your frame, see if the queen's there. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I guess we're going to wrap this thing up. I appreciate you, David, joining us again tonight. We I had a really good time, and I hope everybody else enjoyed Me too, it. Grayson, yeah. And it's really, uh, I want to say uh, hats off to you. Thank um, you. You're, you're a, a, a very energetic young man, and you're pouring your, your heart and your passion into beekeeping and YouTube uh, videos, which is so impressive. I know what that feels like, and I know that it's sometimes this – it has to be challenging and frustrating. And, you know, all of us sometimes wonder, is this even worth it? I don't think I'm getting the reaction. I don't think I'm getting the impact I want to make and helping people doesn't seem to be, you know, it's not sticking or something. And there's always that moment where you just feel like, how, how can I keep doing this? And so hats off to you for just, you know, keeping at it. That's really impressive. And by the way, that's the, uh, I think that's a measure of success is doing the same thing for a long period of time, getting really good at it right. makes you successful. So Definitely keep at it. Keep at it. Absolutely. Thank you. Definitely. I appreciate you. And also, you know, thank everybody who watched us tonight. Go on and check David's channel out. If you, you know, haven't, if you don't know who he is, you know, good videos out there too. You know, um, good information. That's how I learned how to keep bees, you know, the, you know, the right way. And, you know, when you're at it, if you can, you know, if you're new here, go and subscribe and, you know, click the like button. We appreciate it. And we yeah. appreciate David. So um, thank you, David, for coming on here and we'll uh, catch you next time. Thank you, Grayson. Okay. Thanks for having me. Definitely.